Good afternoon. I'll make it all official before we get into it. I'll call you Mr Fenimore. Um, well, I'll just do it. OK, thanks, Sarah. I now welcome well, Mr Scott Fenimore from Ron Fenimore Transport. And for the Hansard record, if you could please give your name and the capacity in which you appear today. Scott Fenimore, General Manager of Ron Fenimore Transport, General and Bulk Freight Divisions. Fantastic. Thanks, Mr. Fenimore. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to um, uh, invite you to make... Well, you've heard what's been going on. We're pretty informal here, um, but I will give the opportunity to make an opening statement before we go to questions. Bearing in mind, um, you can be as long as you want or as short as you like. OK, thank you. So, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Ron has asked me to give his apologies. He would have loved to have been here today, but... It's one of our busiest times of the year. And he's already spent a day this week in Canberra on the current review of the heavy vehicle, National Law. I'm me, I'm the General Manager of the General Freight and Bulk Contracts at Ron Finnamore Transport. This is a hands-on role, which means I'm involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. Basically, that consists of talking to customers, managing freight, drivers and trucks. We mainly operate in regional areas and along the eastern seaboard. I manage 150 of the total of 250 trucks. They're mainly B-doubles and performance-based standard equipment. They've got an average age of 1.8 years. This involves over 300 drivers, who, and the drivers are the lifeblood of our business. Um, the 250 RFT vehicles do between 55 and 60 million kilometres a year. The, this is your 200 vehicles? Yeah. 100, so 100, how many kilometres? I manage 150 vehicles. Yes. And the 250 vehicles do between 55 and oh. 60 million kilometres a year. Okay, yep. The RFT approach is... Uh, safety is a key focus in our business and, and we um, are committed to doing everything safely, reliably and cost-effectively. With safety our number one priority, we have made extensive investments in systems, technology and training, coaching to ensure we operate at the highest level, safest level possible. I'm happy to expand on this point later, especially the investment in our trucks with fitting the fatigue, fatigue and distraction advice, um, advice, devices. We think these devices are a huge and positive game changer in improving fatigue management and road safety. Many other operators are doing that, using the systems and doing likewise. In industry improvement, from a broader perspective, I've been involved in the industry for about 40 years and I've witnessed the massive improvements in the industry, safety practices and culture over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, I think the majority of the industry owns the safety agenda as much as possible in the way they operate today. This change in industry culture, the investment in better roads, the greater active role industry is playing with governments uh, and the introduction of chain of responsibility have, in my view, been the main drivers in improving industry safety. At the same time, the freight task has kept growing with urban freight tasks, a growing challenge. We don't know how long it's going to take. For an example, at the moment, we don't know how long it's going to take once we get to the city to get to get to the delivery point, how long it's going to take to unload and reload, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, and that's been covered with the previous speakers. Mm. So, My list of challenges. To take the next step in improving safety, we need to get some broader settings right to make sure we can continue to progress better safety outcomes. Sitting in my shoes, the main safety challenges I see are as follows. Number one, we need to get the law right in the current review. So we are focused on managing high risk rather than just the compliance and administrative controls, counting time by five minutes, etc. Um, <clears throat> compliance is not necessarily safer and better rewards and flexibilities are required for those, who, for, for those of us who make a safety investment. So better rewards, what was that other word, sorry? Um, my, my, my shorthand's not very short. And flexibility. Flexibility, OK, ta. And there's been previous examples from previous experiences. Yes, that there has been. Can you really get your thoughts on that too, yeah? A more, a more practical skills-based approach needs to be developed for truck driver licensing. We need to encourage and support young people wanting to join the industry straight from school, especially drivers in regional areas, to help address the current critical driver shortage. We currently lose those people who want a career in our industry. There is no apprenticeship for them to enter 
for us to embrace, which we've covered. Um, number three, the law to be more flexible and supportive of industry's huge investment in safety and equipment technology. We believe this investment and the proper use of the technology is the key to continuing to improve industry safety. But unfortunately, some, some want the old and outdated enforcement approach to continue, but the bulk of the industry isn't like that anymore. So it's, um, it's very important to us that the people who invest in the safe, safest equipment and technology can be recognised. Mm. Yeah. Number four, governments also have a key role to play collectively in being part of improving industry safety. Whilst tra truck stops availability has improved a little, we are still a long way from what is needed and local councils are making it harder and harder for drivers to have access to the basics. Toilets, food, rest stops are shrinking um, and as councils put up barriers, no parking signs and load limit signs, you can't ask us to be safer if government doesn't do their bit as far as access. Number five, getting rest in the right spot is made harder by the current and highly prescriptive counting time approach in the law to managing driver safety and fatigue. We lose many good drivers simply because they can't afford to lose their livelihood for a simple counting mistake. Um, this isn't managing fatigue, this is bureaucracy gone mad. Number six, the chain of responsibility has had some positive impact on the supply chain but we have a long way to go. Delays in the not knowing when at distribution centres is still one of our biggest safety challenges. The not knowing causes drivers a great deal of anxiety and stress, and we all know what it's like at the airport and you'll catch a plane. So um, we all know what it's like at the airport when our flight is delayed and we don't know when we'll get home. I imagine there's a lot of drivers playing at home tonight because they've been delayed during with the risk, hence what Chris, sure. Chris quoted earlier. Yep. Um, <clears throat> What drivers have to face with day to day um, is the issue is one of the underlying safety issues. Number seven, my thoughts on other specific issues you have asked about are as follows: We're a company that owns our trucks and employs our drivers. We have an EBA with our drivers and the TWU. Less than three percent of our work is done with subcontractors. Um, this is only on an as needs basis. Um, we've. Deliberately, we've stopped working on, with companies that won't adopt reasonable payment terms of 7, 14 or 30 days, being the absolute worst case occasionally. Um, so that's it. I'm now happy to discuss any aspects of the terms of reference, noting that I won't be able to comment on all areas outside my responsibilities. Mr Fennell, I really appreciate that, and I'm not going to put you in a position where your client's business... I wouldn't do that to you. And, and uh, if you can pass on the wrong... Thanks. Sorry he couldn't be here. I caught him at the ALC ATA Summit. I haven't seen him for years and he's looking younger each year. So well, there you go. Impact. He's not going anywhere in a hurry, is he? Senator Rennie? No, not really. Have you made a submission? No. You just read that? We might ask you to table your... We've got you on record, but we will table your okay. opening statement as well too. No, that's it. That's fine. Okay. Now, look, Mr... Can I call you Scott? Yeah. It's been everyone's first name all day and as long as you call me Glenn. Okay, thanks. Uh, Scott, I'm very keen to hear from um, one of the uh, reputable operators in the industry. There's no argument about that. Um, before I leave today, I've got to ask you why Ron Finnamore's transport's red on top and green underneath. Well, there's a few jokes around, but yeah. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> you, you obviously get off very wonderful. Anyway, let's leave that at that. Um, that's a throwaway line. Now, I notice that you've said that you've strategically taken the uh, business decision to not... Uh, cart freight for clients who want to go beyond 30 days. Is That's that correct. correct? How relevant or how pre prevalent in the industry is the stretching out of payment terms now? Is it more so now more in your 40 years? Has it got worse? Has it been like this for ages or is it getting better? I think it's worse and it's very prevalent. Um, and I know there will be no names but I have uh, first hand um, uh, knowledge of two major clients one going out to 150 days, one out to 120 days. And I ask, even companies as big as uh, yourself, could you survive 120, 150 days? No, that's, that's why we've made the decision not, not to work for those people. As someone said earlier, I think it was O'Brien, it was O'Brien's transport, and I think that they've learned a lot more about banking in the last few years than they wanted to learn. Yeah. So going, going on that, um, and we have had this conversation at the Transport Industry Standards Forum about, you know, some clients, some clients, uh, sorry, some transport companies decide to 
take the longer terms, but they, and the smart operators say, but it's going to cost you X percent or more. And okay, well, good luck to them. That's great. That's no worries. What's the normal reaction when you say to, to these major clients that you won't be cutting their freight unless it's 30 days? Um, there's plenty of other companies out there that will. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And well, this does make it. Now, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky here, Scott, if I can. And you pull me up, and you can do this in any way, shape, or form that you wish to. Yeah. One of the biggest problems that I've had is over the years we've known and we've heard from previous, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> witnesses and, and myself that, you know, the transport industry was, what can we get away with you, beauty, and we'll circumvent all sorts of things and do all that sort of stuff. And now it's getting harder and harder to do. But I'd be very interested from a major employer's point of view that when we have a minimum standard, a, a law in this land that says the modern award, and we know darn well that the exploitation, because there is no enforcement, you've got to compete against these people. Now, I want to ask you as a, as a, as a major uh, um, operator, it, you would expect to lose contracts or win contracts on service, and that's great. That's what we're used to. How does a major company deal with that when you know knowingly well when there are transport companies sailing under the under the bar, under the radar, yep. advertising it on seek, mind you, not hiding it, and knowing that there's a fair work ombudsman that will not get off their fat backsides and get out there in force. You, you step out of line on your compliance and they're on you like a ton of bricks. Yeah, you, have to, around that? You, have, you have to be um, set on your principles and your values um, and be focused on what you can deliver and not get caught up, or not get caught up in a in, uh, race to the bottom. Yeah, we, we have to... We, we have to be you know, safe and reliable, and to do that, we have to charge a premium, and uh, otherwise it's not sustainable long term. So we, I, well, I don't get, we don't get caught up in what the others are doing. We've got to focus on what we're doing so we can get the safest outcome for our business. No, of course, and I appreciate this, Scott, but I flip the card over. Yeah. And I want to I wanna say this, but I'm blaming the top of the supply chain here. This, 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 this is where I, 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 I can't let this off the hook. And we're, we're not talking, you know, we're not talking little flea bag companies, a lot of these, these top of the supply chain. We're talking major corporations. Mm. Now, what is your view on a, um, a chain of responsibility type in uh, catchment of cost recovery models and basic law enforcement of awards when it comes to the, to, to the clients? Would you support that? I I would support a definite understanding of how you consult as a group and get clarity for the best outcome. I'm not I'm not necessarily 100 percent across the um, intricacies, but definitely definitely support consultation as as this through this process. It could be an unfair question to throw at you as a, as a major operator, and that's probably better left to the associations and such. But I think that we, as a as an industry and a nation, we have to have this conversation now. We we absolutely have to because and what we're picking up, and I talk about what comes across my desk daily. You would, you would believe because you've seen it, but I, I'm really alarmed while we talk about a free market. And hey, I want the cheapest flat screen TV I can get too. But when we start arguing about the difference between an onion is one cent or a banana or a flat screen TV while it's being driven down the bottom. So, Scott, have you seen it as bad as this over the years? Is it getting tougher? Yes. Okay. I, think, I, think, I think it's getting tougher. I, I, um, what, you, what your reference to tougher is and how you categorise that is the is the opportunity but yeah it's definitely tougher when you look at when you look at access you look at rising prices you, yeah. you look at people availability it's definitely definitely tougher sure and there was someone who said to me in the west not long ago that a transport operator said to me in the west that our difference between a profit and, error and, and, a, and, a, and a reputable transport operator uh, line all uh, the profit margin now is either if there's a headwind or not and that's alarming. That, that's really scary. So, look, I won't 
embarrass or try to, well, not try to embarrass you. But let's walk away from Finnables. Let's talk about industry stuff um, and the things that we, we should be speaking about as an industry, things that can be controlled. My lo- my view on this, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that can fix up this this, this industry. When I say fix this up, make this industry far more viable, sustainable, safe and profitable. Yeah. And I talk about government relations and you touched on, I think, Scott, you touched on the ridiculousness of uh, fines and all sorts of stuff. But let's go to the compliance side. And we'd heard earlier on that your compliance is for every darn contract, every job, every client. Every... So give us some thoughts around how that could be improved. There you go. That takes it to an industry level, not just your business, I, I, I think. So the current legislation and compliance rules are complex. They're outdated and inflexible for drivers and operators. For example, I'm told there's over 150 pages of law on managing fatigue and working hours. This is under the NHPR, under the NHPL, just the 150 pages there? Um, oh, okay, I'm not sure. sure. Sorry, okay, 150 pages yeah. on managing fatigue. Yeah. That's making me tired to think about it. Yeah. Thinking about it. It's current legislation. Yeah. Often a big stick approach is used by enforcement where industry and especially drivers are penalised for minor issues rather than working with operators involved to improve safety for the long term. Yeah. <clears throat> we, we need to manage the risk rather than just the compliance and administrative controls and regulatory burden on the industry. Um, the chain of responsibility, all stakeholders are responsible. A supply chain delays at customer sites, DCs, this causes time pressure and anxiety for drivers. Um, the law needs to be flexible but at the same time prescriptive for those that need it to be prescriptive. Excuse, excuse me. It needs to target high risk operators and drivers, not low risk operators who are the most part doing the right thing. Yeah, let's talk about that. How will we do that? Do you have a view? No, I don't, I don't okay, have you. That's right. It, it needs to focus on improving safety now and in the future. It needs to encourage the use of technology for improving safety and compliance with legislation. So with, uh, um, with one of our earlier witnesses, um, with um, Mr McIntosh from O'Brien Transport, I think he was saying, or it could have been Mr O'Brien, that um, surely the more efficient way of doing this, that there should be a body thing, I can't remember who they said, someone, if you can remember, help me out, rather than continue to keep, here it is in this town, there is one auditor, who, and you probably, oh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, single, single yeah. regulatory body. Yeah. What is it? It's a central portal. Thank you very much. My head's starting to cabbage now. Um, a central portal, yes. It's that time of day. Three hour time difference, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it is that time. My circadian rhythm. Yeah, okay. The central portal. So there is one person in this town that comes in and does the audits, but it's the same person that comes and does the audit 10, 15, 20 times. Would you support that, that there should just be a central portal where you do all what you need to do for compliance? They never get annoyed again. If anyone wants to see it, they come straight to that central portal. Would that be a plus? Yes, we're, we're aligned with, um, we're over, we're over audited. So anything where we can remove the four or five, six different audits that are required on a yearly basis. So what they came out to, to Scott was that, um, in this one company, and they said it very clearly on the record, so I'm not speaking out of school, was they've got someone employed just to do compliance. And Mr O'Brien made it very clear the time that's taken out there should be out in the yard making sure that it's complied rather than this. And I suppose with Finnamore Transport, and I don't know how many trucks O'Brien's had, but, but um, it would be very, um, um, it would be very good to get your view on it. Because we want, to, we want to write recommendations. We actually want to recommend to the government, hey, this is what the industry's saying. Bear in mind, there's the three tiers of government and all that sort of stuff we've got to get through. But if look, the political if the political will in this nation is there, anything can happen. Yes. So I'm very keen to to uh, get any other ideas from you. Uh, for us, uh, for us, the compliance side of it's very um, very burdensome. There's a lot. Of, there's we have to employ a number of people to to do the basics of of managing the administrative component. And uh, I agree with you. We'd be better off having those people out out in the on the forecourt mm, training yeah. and training and, and you do a number of different audits throughout the throughout the year and if we could just have it as as one audit that, that would uh, be 
be definitely beneficial. And if there was any extra uh, evidence needed, it's, it's a case of send an email. Okay, yeah. great. That's not that's correct. All right, Scott, can I go to the fatigue and distraction devices you were talking about? And just what do you do in your business? What are they? Um, our business uses a device called Seeing Eye Machine. Mm -hmm. and it, Explain it a bit for those that are listening who might not know. It, it, it's a machine that um, is fitted to the cab of the, in the cab of the truck where the driver sits and it's, it uses infrared technology based on algorithms to, um, to measure the driver's face movements and it, the face movements identify fatigue and or distraction and then if the driver of the vehicle becomes fatigued um, or shows signs of fatigue, eye blink or long eye blink or distraction out the, the window or mobile phone use, it sends off an alarm and the, the fatigue component it sends off a beeping noise and the seat vibrates mm -hmm. and it, it'll, it alerts the driver that he's had an event and the camera engages and that gets sent to um, the, the monitoring centre and the monitoring centre identified based on the algorithm and the length of time identified the drivers um, had an event, whether it be an eye closure or face droop or, or drop or whatever that may be, mm -hmm. gets categorised. That then gets an email automatically gets sent to our operations centre. The, the operations centre get the email and there's also a phone call and to alert us that the driver's had an event. We then contact the driver identify if he's okay, ask him a series of questions, our business asks him a series of questions to, to understand if he's heard the alarm or to clarify his level of fatigue and make sure he's right. And sometimes he might say he's got um, sun in his eyes or he was rubbing his eyes or, or he was tired and he, he's going to pull up. And um, at, we, at that point we give advice on what he should do. If, he has a, um, if it goes off again, he has a second event. Um, we then tell him to pull up and make sure that he, he's had the event he needs to pull up and have a rest. So for us it's been very rewarding to making sure because you can, I'm more tired Monday morning after stop for a, stop for a weekend having to go again after an hour's work rather than Friday afternoon. So that for us it gives, a drive, it gives us some opportunity to manage a driver's fatigue. So Scott, how was that accepted by the, by, I know you've got 250 trucks, but you've obviously got more drivers than you have trucks, so yeah. how was that accepted by the workforce? Very positive. Good. Yeah. Good okay. um, right. drive, drivers, um, re renowned, drivers w want to do things right. Drivers want to be seen as professional. They don't want to be dangerous and they, they don't want to be fatigued. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You, you ask the majority of, of drivers, they'll have their own telltale signs of fatigue and predominantly that's they come to that point and then they they'll pull up as a result of their behavior um i get itchy itchy legs just yeah so i sure. want to pull up yeah. um and as a result they they've accepted it very much some of them have changed their behavior they pull up 15 minutes earlier but yeah they're very supportive of it so scott this was a, an initiative an issue. And of course, the insurance company couldn't make give you a deduction in their charges for doing that. No, oh. no you didn't have to answer that. So, yeah, no. But what I'm like, sorry, but I'm, that's me just being devious, having a crack. If, if you're safer, it, based on how insurance works, whatever whatever you invest in as safety, if, if you get a lower premium, you get. You get the reward, don't you? So. Yeah, this is just my side thing, saying the insurance companies have a real role to play here and now in our okay. industry. Um, but coming back to that then, Scott, that's so it's accepted. So this is something Finnamore's, uh, Ron Finnamore Transport did off your own bat. Did you do it in conjunction with your clients? Uh, no, we did Did you get we, any assistance from government? No, we did it off our own bat. We're, we're, we're always looking at the newest technology, how we can keep our, get our people home safer. How, how we can, what's out there, we always go, we tend to go global and see what's available. So so, the, so do you retrofit retrofit these into existing vehicles? Or yes. Really new? So that would be a cost. I'm not going to ask you how much. Definitely a cost. Definitely. But it, it's, um, it's definitely worth it based on the, the safety outcome. Now, being very careful, could I get a rough estimate? Uh, 
Okay. I'm happy for the no, provider no. to contact you and give you a quote. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Right. Actually, if they can send us something through. I, I, I would be interested to see because, you know, I'm happy for you to contact them. And you send me the contact details. Okay. Now, you also talked about broader settings and you went for better rewards and flexibility. What did that mean? For what was that? Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, that was the compliance. No, no, sorry. I've written down the fatigue and distraction devices, the broader settings. Don't worry about that. Right, then I wrote compliance, better rewards. So the broader settings. So what other broader settings? What other broader settings do you do? In safety, yeah. So, uh, you know that fly that was annoying you three minutes ago. Yeah, well, the bug yes. over here now. Yeah. Still here. Okay. Um, safety. So, so we're strategically our fleet's one point eight years old on average. Um, when we buy the fleet, we we aim for the important criteria, and that purchase is the safest equipment available. I call it the hamburger for the lot. We buy the safety. Yeah, well, that's we, terminology, yeah. We buy the safety, buy the gear with the highest ranking, all the safety features, and we have it so it can't be turned off. So you can get safety equipment now that can be switched on and off. Your lane departures, you've got, probably got a, uh, all got the safe cars. Yep. Well, our equipment's all got all the gear turned on, and uh, we invest heavily in that part of it. Okay, now one of my one of my favourite things, and I like to talk about, but it's it's raised itself with every witness today, is attracting um, uh, kids, uh, young people to our industry, and how do we attract women to our industry and all that sort of stuff. Now you mentioned apprenticeships. Yes. Now obviously you've got your own workshops and all that sort of stuff. Is that right? Yes. Where you'd have apprenticeships. There, yeah, our, our business is predominantly line haul, so so yeah. we don't have the forklift operators or the warehouses or the uh, or the rigids. Right. Um, but but for us, it's about how you can bring people, young people, into the industry as early as possible and keep them. And well, um, well let's let's explore that. How do you do that? Because I've got the fly back over to you now. Yeah. So so how do you attract young people to your industry? If you're all line that, that that that's, that's the tough, that's the tough question. We yeah. we um we have to take on a range of experienced and newly licensed and... and but you don't have the PUD fleet, do you? That's what you were saying. No, we don't have the PUD fleet. But, but we, we have to have a range of new people. So our new people come in, we, we buddy them up with a driver for, for a week, we identify whether they've got the, got the skill based on their feedback, um, based on their, their driver behaviour, and then we partner them we partner them as we go we select the runs we give them and then if they don't have any incidents or they they behave as and they're compliant we um progress them in the business but there's they go from one to the other to the other just like was quoted before yeah and so so it was spot on the quote before we advertise on a saturday we're always looking for for drivers like all of us so we've got a shortage yeah definitely yeah, it's coming really loud and clear and our average, I'm hearing all different terms. I mean, some people tell me the average age of our truck drivers are 54 or something, but I'm hearing 47. Maybe it's the West Australians are a bit older. But, but it's a concern. It really yeah. is a concern. So, look, just in wrapping up, Scott, and I appreciate the time you've been here. So you've got your 250 trucks, of which 150 you manage. Yes. And, but the 250 cover anywhere between 55 to 60 million kilometres a year. That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Do you hot seat them? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm trying to figure out how you get with the, with the fatigue. We do a range depending on depending on contract. We do shuttles. We do hot seat. We yeah. have one driver trucks. Uh, just to, and that's 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 all part of whatever we need to do to get the best outcome out of the safest yeah. and best outcome out of out of the um, contract. We're deliberately we we are we're a family business deliberately in. Orange, Wagga and Wodonga. Wodonga's our head office. And that helps us with our value with people and being regional. We can get drivers into and out of the city and get them back to here. And a lot of our fleet drivers are home every night or every second night. Yeah, good stuff. They're, they're, not, they're not in Sydney or Melbourne being held over. Yeah. Um, so the intent, as much as possible, we like to get our people home and get them in their own beds. Tremendous, then. I did lie. I've got one more question. Um, in terms of the fatigue management uh, systems that we have, the AFM and BFM, and then we have Western Australia and other things in between and all sorts of other things, uh, one thing that allows me is, is the inflexibility within the system, 
particularly here on the eastern seaboard where I hear stories of drivers become you know, one hour or half hour away from home and can't get home. You mentioned that tonight, uh, today, where you said some drivers may not get home tonight because of a something about a DC or something That's like that. That's correct. Something yeah. like that. So if you had the opportunity to put some flexibility into the fatigue management systems, what would it look like? Uh, it'd have to be, it'd be, we want to align around the um, systems, the DSS systems and the systems that recognise, that give you the opportunity to recognise fatigue. And and for us, the fact that the, the operator's done so many hours work, he, he may feel good and he can't get home. So it's the system for us gives us that assurity. Um, where the system gives you that assurity. Yeah, the DSS system. What, what is DSS? That's the driver safety system that I just spoke. Oh, the seeing the, eye machine. I call it oh, yeah, driver safety s- seeing eye machine. Right, got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we can we our operators are trained in in identifying whether the driver's fatigued. We have the the seeing eye machine. We we can tell whether the driver's had any events. You use those systems in conjunction with your with your time management and your work work diaries, you, you can get the best outcome. So have you had that conversation with the legislators or the regulators, I should say? I think it's so. currently underway. Sorry? I think it's currently underway. Okay, all right. Good luck. Good luck with that one. Because that's the sort of, yeah, that's the sort of thing that I, I, it does annoy me. I know you have to draw the line because someone may say I'm feeling fantastic and then if it's an accident, oh, my goodness me, I'll get all that sort of stuff. But um, let's hope we can, and I know it's state-based, which makes it even harder, but I know that I, I think the nation's ready for a, a fair dinkum retalk about this sort of stuff. It really is. Yes. So, so Scott, I don't have any more because I appreciate this. You succinctly remind me it's Friday Arbor and we're not as tired as we were on Monday morning. Don't right? miss that play. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So. Otherwise, I'm going straight into Cameron sulking. So, Scott, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank you very much for making the effort today. I will find out why there's red on the bottom. No okay. green on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> we'll do that off, off camera. Uh, but thank you very much for coming today. We really do appreciate it, and we know where to get you if we need to clarify anything up. Can I also take this opportunity for our, our witnesses that have come today, all of you from from other parts of that, rather than Norbury. It's been absolutely brilliant to hear from you all. I do appreciate it. I won't be the last time I see you all or have conversations with you, I have no doubt. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Secretariat, Sarah. Trish, thank you. Magnificent effort, as per always. Pat, thank you, mate, on Hansard and Broadcasting. From behalf of the committee, that, uh, that concludes today's hearing. The committee now stands adjourned.